Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I call my presentation Disrupting the Pipeline to Prison in New Orleans, 2005-2015. Uh, What's important to understand, of course, is that the history of police violence against black bodies in New Orleans has a long, long history. So is our fight back against police violence, police terror. In fact, in New Orleans, we don't even call it police brutality anymore. We call it police terror because that's what it actually is. It is terror. It is systematic. It's organized. And it's aimed at keeping black folks in their place. Louisiana leads the world in incarceration. New Orleans leads the, uh, Louisiana in incarceration. The New Orleans ruling class has decided that the way to deal with poverty and inequality is to arrest black bodies. Activists in New Orleans have been waging a determined fight to de derail the incarceration train by radically reforming two elements of the criminal justice system, the NOPD and the Orleans Parish Prison, OPP. New Orleans Police Department and Orleans Parish Prison are both under supervision of federal consent decrees right now. These consent decrees exist because of the hard work and dedication of police and prison reform activists in New Orleans. We consciously sought to disrupt the pipeline to prison in New Orleans. Today, I'll discuss how we got these consent decrees and the lessons learned from our struggle. Ostensibly, Mayor Landrieu appoints the police superintendent, and the police superintendent answers to the mayor. Now, the NOPD is supervised by federal district judge Susie Morgan. The NOPD entered into a consent decree with the federal government in 2013 and Judge Morgan is supposed to make sure that the NOPD is making progress towards constitutional policing. Ostensibly, Sheriff Marlon Gusman runs the OPP. Now he must answer to a federal district judge, Lance Afric. Uh, in 2009, the United States Department of Justice, after investigating conditions at OPP, sent a highly critical report. And it reads, I quote, we find that the OPP fails to adequately protect inmates from harm from staff and other inmates, fails to provide inmates with adequate mental health care, fails to provide adequate suicide prevention, fails to provide adequate medication management, fails to provide safe and sanitary environmental conditions, and fails to provide adequate fire safety precautions. In 2012, 10 inmates in OPP filed a lawsuit alleging frequent rapes, beatings, and stabbings. Following the filing of the lawsuit, Sheriff Guzman agreed to a, a consent decree with the Department of Justice. These decrees both emanated from complaints of activists and pleas from victim families for justice that the mayor and the sheriff, of course, were uh, ignoring. The there has always been a sizable cadre of community activists who challenged police terror and police murder prior to Hurricane Katrina. I was chairman of the Afro-American Liberation League, which organized families to oppose police abuse. For instance, in early 2005, we had been conducting a struggle around the police murder of Jannard Thomas, a 25-year-old black man who was killed in the Upper Ninth Ward. In fact, uh, the Monday before Hurricane Katrina hit, we were having demonstrations with some of our uh, students from Douglas High School uh, protesting his murder. Our many years of struggle against the NOPD terror has taught us that the capitalist state apparatus protects its own. The U.S. criminal justice system, from the police to the coroner to the district attorney and to the courts, all support the oppression by police aimed at keeping the working class uh, and poor in their oppressed condition. We also learned through bitter experience that even our victories, when we get a, a police charge uh, with a crime, are temporary. Um, one of the organizations that developed after the uh, Katrina uh, was the Community United for Change, and that organization organized itself and called for the Department of Justice to come into New Orleans and take over the NOPD. Uh, this was issued, of course, because nothing was done about the murders that occurred on the Danziger Bridge, and the local justice system would not prosecute these murderers. In the aftermath of the massive flooding in New Orleans after the levees broke, 
news reports re-victimized black New Orleanians by portraying them as lawless looters. Governor Kathleen Blanco announced that she was dispatching the National Guard to New Orleans with the orders to shoot looters. Warren Riley, deputy police chief, was reported as having given orders to cops to fire at will on looters. The NOPD acted on these instructions. On September 2nd, 2005, Henry Glover, a 32-year-old black man, was gunned down by police uh, sniper David Warren. Glover was out with a friend looking for uh, food. Warren, carrying his personal hunting rifle, shot him from 100 feet away. He claimed that Glover was threatening his life. Henry Glover was gravely wounded. A good Samaritan, William Tanner, uh, put uh, Glover in his car and drove to a school where the police had a, a staging area. Instead of helping Mr. Glover, they pulled Tanner out and beat him and took the car and drove it behind the 4th District Station and set it on fire. The uh, NOPD, of course, tried to cover up this murder of uh, Mr. Glover and was telling his family they didn't know where he was. On September 3rd, you got to remember these are the days immediately after August 29th. On September 3rd, 45-year-old Danny Brumfield was killed by the NOPD officer Ronald Mitchell as he tried to flag down a car for help in front of the convention center. On September 4th, of course, we had the two families trying to cross the Danziger Bridge, and they were set upon by the New Orleans Police Department who drove up in a van, a moving truck, a budget rental truck, got out of the truck and started firing. And of course, two of those members of the two families were killed, including James Brissett, a 17-year-old kid, uh, I understand he was also in the, your program, right? Right. And further up the bridge, Ronald Madison, a mentally challenged 40-year-old, was killed by the police. Uh, and four other people were wounded, including Susan Bartholomew, who was a 38-year-old mother who had her arm shot off by the NOPD. These three outrageous cases of police murder in the days following Katrina served as a galvanizing event which allowed for a coalition of individuals and organizations to agree to work together with the families to get justice for their loved ones. Uh, years passed and finally in 2006, uh, Eddie Jordan, the city's first black DA, indicted the Danzer cops. When they turned themselves in, they were held as heroes by the NOPD officers. In fact, they had a rally in front of the police of the courthouse on Broad Street and uh, cheered them as they turned themselves in. A state judge, of course, refused to accept the charges from DA uh, Eddie Jordan uh, and threw the cases out. And finally, in, uh, we were able to get the federal government to come in. In 2007, the People's Hurricane Relief Fund, a coalition of progressive and uh, Progressive forces fighting for the right of Katrina victims to return to New Orleans held an international tribunal. The tribunal presented testimony from police terror victims to a panel of international judges from seven countries. Uh, the Madison family, uh, led by Dr. Romel Madison, a prominent dentist in New Orleans, was able to get support from the National Dental Association and the Congressional Black Caucus to finally get the Department of Justice to come to New Orleans to investigate the, the NOPD. Uh, in that period, the Community United for Change launched a series of town hall meetings where we call people from all quarters of the city to come and testify about the uh, activities of the New Orleans Police Department. In those hearings, we came up with a list of 20 uninvestigated, unindicted, uncharged cases of murder at the hands of the NOPD that we submitted to the Justice Department. In the spring of 2011, the uh, Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department issued its findings letter. This findings letter confirmed all of the complaints that we had made about the terrorist activity of the New Orleans Police Department. It stated that the NOPD had a long history of unconstitutional policing, 
It stated that the NOPD was in need of a radical reform in all areas. It also pointed out that outside employment policies of the NOPD, which allowed rank and file police to provide detailed employment for their superiors, was the center of, or as they called it, the aorta of corruption. Mayor Landrieu accepted this and pledged that he was going to work with us to rein in his terrorist police organization. Uh, but he wanted to assume the posture that he was for police reform. He fired Warren Riley and announced a search committee for a new police chief. He even invited some of the anti-police terror activists to join his committee. Uh, but of course, this was just posturing. He rejected the choices of that committee and appointed his childhood friend, Ronald Surpass. Surpass, of course, would be, uh, prove to be uh, an opponent of change within the department. And we had to launch a struggle there to get rid of Surpass. Um, beginning in 2010, the CUC began to hold a series of town hall meetings designed to draft the People's Consent Decree, outlining the residents' vision of what a reformed NOPD would look like. The People's Consent Decree included demand for body cameras on police, a 20-hour limit on outside employment of police officers, a residency requirement, and most Im important, a civilian review board with subpoena power to investigate charges of police misconduct. This was, of course, in addition to overcoming the Office of Municipal Investigation, which had been started after the Algiers killings in the 1980s, but which had no subpoena power. And we want, the, the last thing that we argued for was that we wanted seats at the table along with the city and the Justice Department to, uh, to uh, administer a, a consent decree. And we cited Cincinnati, Ohio as an example of community having its representative at the con uh, negotiation tables. In 2010, 2011, the Justice Department won convictions of the cops who shot and covered up the murder of Henry Glover. They also won convictions of the cops who beat Raymond Robert to death prior to Hurricane Katrina. Also in, in 2010, 21-year-old Adolph Grimes was murdered in front of his grandmother's house. He was set upon by the NOPD plains closed officers uh, in the early hours and, uh, and prosecuted. The interesting thing, of course, is the Department of Justice, even though we presented solid evidence, refused to accept this case. The lawyers, their lawyers told CUC that they could not afford to prosecute this case, that they did not have enough money to do it in their budget. In February 2012, uh, the Department of Justice was still in New Orleans conducting its investigations when a raid on a house in Gentilly resulted in the murder of 20-year-old Wendell Allen. The, the NOPD stormed the house, which had five children under age 10, claiming it was a drug house. Wendell Allen was asleep in the upstairs bedroom, and when he heard the commotion, he ran to the top of the stairs, and he was shot down by uh, New Orleans police officer Joseph Kokla. Uh, he, the officer, of course, claimed that he saw a weapon. Luckily, there was an officer who had his own personal body camera on, and he captured the whole uh, event on his body camera. And instead of confessing that this was a bad shoot, uh, they went after the officer with the body camera and tried to prosecute him for uh, bringing uh, outside uh, materials onto the job. Then on March 1st, at 5.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, Justin Sipp, on his way to work at a Burger King, was shot and killed. Uh, by New Orleans police officer Stephen Girard. Girard was working on a private detail. One of the features in New Orleans since Katrina has been the proliferation of private details where communities, middle class white communities, hire off duty New Orleans policemen to patrol their areas. One of the consequences of that is that young black people who venture into those districts are ran out by these. Uh, police, and they are directed to keep blacks out of that area. So at 5.30 in the morning, a young man who has decided that he wants to do the right thing, is on the way to work, 
is assaulted by New Orleans police and killed. And this is why, while the Justice Department is in town investigating the misadventures of the New Orleans pol police. Okay. All right. Also, at the same time, simultaneously, the Orleans Parish uh, Prison Reform Coalition has been struggling to uh, improve the conditions of the Orleans Parish Jail. There were 6,000 prisoners in Orleans Parish Prison when Hurricane Katrina hit the city, uh, making it the second largest prison in the country. And we were uh, uh, campaigning to reduce the number of inmates and the OPPC, uh, the Orleans Parish Prison Reform Coalition uh, won a concession that the rebuilding of the prison, we would not have more than 1,400 uh, inmates, which is more in conformity with the size of our city. This, of course, had to be accompanied with an agreement by the NOPD that they were going to quit locking up people for minor problems. One of the ways in which they fund the jails in New Orleans has been to pick up people for minor offenses and put them in jail, and the jail is funded by the number of prisoners in there, and they get a per diem per prisoner. And so we have gotten an agreement from the city that they, instead of taking people to jail for minor offenses now, they are issuing uh, tickets that you can go and take care of. Uh, but that's one of the ways that we're trying to disrupt uh, the amount of people who are incarcerated needlessly. And of course, if you build a prison with 6,000 beds, you're going to fill it. And that is going to make sure that the New Orleans police interact more frequently, more viciously with the residents there. And uh, of course, what we have learned is that this impossible situation that we're faced with has to be met by massive resistance. And we have sought to organize ourselves. And even in this organization, we realize that the federal government is not our friend in this uh, situation. The federal government has gone along with the oppression. And that oppression is meant to keep black people and poor working people in their place. And that's the story of New Orleans. And we can talk to more in the question and answer. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me if I talk from, no, that's not working. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, there we go. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, keep it really close. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, I want to thank, um, first of all, Jordan, who called me last spring, telling me he was thinking of this event and how excited um, I was. And it's just really um, unusual to get to have so many amazing people together in a space um, to talk about the storm in such critical, thoughtful, non-lying ways, which is so much of what there's been the last 10 plus years. Um, so I'm gonna actually build off of some of what Malcolm was just talking about. Um, I've been trying to think a lot about incarceration in Louisiana for about 10 years now and realizing how much I need to think back in the 1870s and the 1970s. So I'm gonna take us back a bit today. Um, so as Malcolm was just t alluding to some, in the immediate aftermath of Katrina, news circulated about the failure of the city to evacuate Orleans Parish Prison, the New Orleans City Jail. Over the next several months, details emerged about the organized abandonment that produced the overwhelming chaos that left thousands of primarily black prisoners locked up in that flooded jail. Of note to multiple parties, including the ACLU and their critical report, Abandoned and Abused, was the extent to which state prisoners individuals who had already been sentenced and in most other places would be locked up in a long-term prison were being held in OPP. The ACLU was not the first organization to draw attention to the practice of locking up long-term state prisoners in the city jail. For more than a year prior to the storm, community activists with OPPRC had highlighted that this practice was a key factor in the ballooning of OPP to in, in like 0405 to over 7,000 beds for a city of a population at the time of 450,000 residents. This arrangement had been underwritten and spurred on by a per diem state appropriation system, whereby rather than having a static yearly operating budget, 
The Sheriff's Department's funding from both the City and the Department of Corrections is continually in flux based on how many people are held in bed, held behind bars each night. Organizers with OPPRC RC and others have pointed out that this system of appropriating funds incentivizes the locking up of more and more individuals and sheriffs not just in Orleans Parish but across the state vying for state prisoners to be placed in their particular jail. This has contributed not to not only the growth of OPP leading up to this storm but the crisis of mass incarceration facing Louisiana as a whole. To understand what produced the state of affairs, it's imperative that we go back to yet another man-made disaster the crisis that overtook the Louisiana penal system during the 1970s. In this moment, the problems and contradictions that had been accumulating for decades came to a head, leading federal courts to mandate that Louisiana institute a slew of prison reforms. While in this moment many paths were possible, the state eventually chose to go down the path of expanding the Louisiana carceral state to an unprecedented scale with a particular reliance on parish jails. I argue that this choice was never inevitable, and tracking the material and ideological conditions, and particularly their conjunction, that led to this move, as well as the alternatives offered but not taken up, is critical to understanding how the disaster of OPP came to be during the storm, and the strategies taken up by recent anti-prison organizing efforts. The history of the Louisiana penal system is marked through crisis. For the majority of the 20th century, such crises revolved around the state's singular prison, the Louisiana State Penitentiary, more commonly referred to as Angola. Having long been known as the bloodiest prison in the nation, the prison entered into an unmatched crisis of legitimacy during the 1970s. Conditions were wretched, and stabbings and escapes were monthly affairs. Within this climate, scores of incarcerated people filed lawsuits against, the, against prisons nationwide, and Louisiana was no exception. In 1975, U.S. Magistrate Frank Polozola found in favor of four black prisoners at Angola, Hayes Williams, Lee E. Stevenson, Arthur Mitchell Jr., and Lazarus B. Joseph, who had filed a lawsuit against Angola in 1971 for a number of constitutional issues, including, but not limited to, medical neglect, unsafe facilities, religious discrimination, ongoing racial segregation, and overcrowding. Polozola declared the penitentiary to be in a state of extreme public emergency. Massive changes were ordered in the name of restoring incarcerated people's constitutional rights. For the next several years, the Louisiana penal system, including parish jails, were under the jurisdiction of federal court orders. While many issues were brought to the forefront during this uh, time through the legal ruling, overcrowding became the one that the Department of Corrections, or the DOC, took um, its lead on. The federal courts ordered that Angola's prison population be reduced from just over 4,000 prisoners to 2,641 prisoners within a few months' time. In response, the DOC began looking for sites for new, what they termed satellite prisons that Angola prisoners could be transferred to and potentially could replace Angola altogether. With time at a premium, the DOC scrambled to find and convert a wide range of surplus state property from schools to hospitals to even a decommissioned Navy ship into new prisons throughout the state. There were few concerns about funding such conversions and meeting the other court mandates due to the availability of the recently created funds through the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration or the LEA grants that were available, as well as the exponential increase in Louisiana's oil revenue during the 1970s in response to the global jump in oil prices following OPEC's price hike. However, the DOC had extreme difficulty in attaining support of local residents who routinely protested such new prison plans. Mobilized via fears of dangerous criminals that were more than often coded as black and in rural parishes as urban, communities from Caddo Parish to Bastyr City to New Orleans East were successful in keeping out new satellite prisons. At the same time, parish jails throughout Louisiana entered into their own state of emergency as they were forced to accommodate the prisoners prohibited from being transferred to Angola, inciting anger in local sheriffs statewide. In response to these challenges, DO Secretary of the time, Elaine Hunt, and Angola Warden C. Paul Phelps, who are interesting characters in their own right with a lot of complications, um, they were, had long been concerned about the rise of lifers um, at Angola, and they actually joined in the, the call being led at the time by some of Angola's incarcerated activists for a different solution to the overcrowding crisis, which would be to let people out. Um, however, then DA, New Orleans' his own Harry Connick Sr., 
was adamantly against such proposals. At the time, Connick was in the process of building his career on the racist, tough-on-crime policies and politics sweeping the nation. He routinely attacked DOC officials in the press for advocating early release and alternatives to incarceration. In fact, in the same months the federal court orders were coming down, he successfully pushed for more punitive policies. Oh, am I? Thank you, Jordan. Um, for more pu punitive policies and practices through working with the NOPD to attain LEA grants to expand the department's policing powers. In addition, he personally drafted dozens of draconian crime bills that instituted mandatory sentencing, reduced good time and parole, um, with the increasingly law and order state legislature more than happy to pass these laws. With arrest rates going up, sentencing becoming harsher, and the number of people being paroled steadily dropping, overcrowding pressure intensified across the state. Um, by the decade's end, it was clear that Louisiana's politicians were attempting to build their way out of this overcrowding crisis. Three new prisons were built in just a few short years, with more on the way, and thousands of new beds were added to Angola to more than double the state's prison population from 3,550 people in 1975 to 8,661 people in 1980. This unprecedented carceral state building project was emboldened and buttressed by the 1980 election of David Treen, who had explicitly campaigned on a tough on crime platform, and by Paula Zola, who's now a federal judge, who began to mandate that Louisiana deal with its overcrowding crisis through the creation of new prisons. Yet, as incarcerated activists with the Angolite and the Lifers Association noted, as well as free world prison reformers, growing the state's carceral apparatus did not solve this crisis, but propelled further overcrowding. The ongoing overcrowding at the prisons further increased pressure on dozens of parish jails that were relied on yet again to house thousands of state prisoners, leading to overflowing jails from New Orleans to Lafayette. In the case of New Orleans, the situation became so dire that in the summer of 1983, then Sheriff Foti erected a tent jail to expand the capacity of OPP by a couple hundred beds. While sheriffs everywhere were frustrated by the situation, their responses to such overcrowding was markedly different in the early 1980s than it had been in the mid-70s. When parish jails had filled to capacity in response to the 1975 court orders, sheriffs lobbied to get state prisoners out of their jails. But only a few years later, sheriffs collectively petitioned the state on one hand to get so-called violent offenders out of their jails, but they also pushed for more funds to renovate and expand their jails to make space for both folks awaiting trial as well as for more state prisoners. We can understand this from a number of vantage points. While in 1975 the overcrowding crisis appeared to be temporary, by the early 1980s there was no sign of incarceration rates letting up as Treen and the state legislature continued to press for more punitive laws. In addition, while when, when parish officials had been compelled to release people to stay within the population limits set by Judge Polozola, the media regularly attacked them for letting out such so-called criminals loose in the streets. With both politicians and the media employing fear-mongering tactics, political will was on the side of jail expansion, to say nothing of prison expansion, versus early release or alternatives to incarceration. In fact, Treen's decision, pri decision to prioritize jail construction over education, health care, and keeping up the levies in the state budget was, quote, not out of a desire to make life easier for these convicts, but to make sure no judge feels compelled to release somebody back into society who should not be there just because prisons are overcrowded, end quote. And indeed, as the Louisiana Coalition on Jails and Prisons would highlight in their decarceration campaigns throughout the 1980s, the atrocious conditions within jails persisted alongside their shiny new renovations. Sheriff's desire to build up their parish jails aligned not only with the ascendant revanchivist politics of racial neoliberal governance, but also with the economic conditions being confronted by the state. When sheriffs were first required to take in state prisoners in 75, it was a financial burden since the DOC was paying the sheriff, the sheriff department a per diem rate of only $4.50 a day. But as the overcrowding crisis wore on, local parish officials, including sheriffs, successfully petitioned the state to increase the per diem to $18.25 by 1980, which is quite a leap. The higher per diem rate made sheriffs much more amenable to housing state prisoners as they were able to use these funds in any which way they wanted to expand their carceral apparatus. What's more is that this per diem system met the financial needs of the broader state as well, 
Since so-called redemption, AKA the Jim Crow regime, Louisiana had been loath to finance the penal system. To meet the 1975 federal court orders, the state was required to increase funding to the DOC on an unmatched scale. The DOC budget during this time shot up from $20 million in 1974 to $135 million in 82, with tens of millions of dollars being spent on new prison construction, which as previously mentioned had been financed primarily through the boom in the oil economy. Yet as oil dependent economies are notoriously precarious, Louisiana entered into an economic crisis in the early 80s as oil prices began to fall. While at this time, Louisiana switched to primarily financing prison construction through bonds, such debt financing, financing schemes could not be utilized to fund the DOC operating budget. Thus, expanding jails to house state prisoners was a more financially viable option, given that even with its increase, the per diem system rate is significantly below the cost of keeping someone locked up in Angola, St. Gabriel, Dixon, or any of the other state prisons. What had started out as a temporary spatial fix had become the long-term geographic solution to prison overcrowding. By 2000, which by this point Louisiana gains the title of having the highest incarceration rate in the nation, almost half of the state's prisoners were behind bars in parish jails, with OPP as the largest jail in the state. When the levees broke on the morning, um, when the levees broke on the morning of August 29, 2005, this arrangement had become so normalized that parish jails were routinely referred to as local prisons. The brutal and violent conditions that the individuals who happened to be locked up in OPP found themselves in the hours, days, weeks, and months following the storm was not an instance of the criminal justice system breaking, but the logical result of the accumulated decisions made by a racial capitalist state in crisis. These incarcerated individuals, state prisoners alike, um, or state prisoners alongside those who just happened to be picked up by the NOPD on the 28th or the 27th, were transferred here and there across the state into far-flung state prisons and parish jails, while folks arrested in the storm's aftermath, as Malcolm mentioned, um, or, and I think also Shana mentioned before, were locked up in the Greyhound Station that had been converted into a temporary jail. Almost five years after the federal flood, the city was granted $270 million in FEMA recovery funds to rebuild the OPP jail complex that had been flooded. Because of the damages, OPP had shrunk in size by several thousand beds from its pre-storm capacity. In response to the new monies, um, the current New Orleans Sheriff, Marlon Gussman, proposed using the FEMA funds not to just rebuild, but to expand OPP closer to its previous size. In response, folks with OPPRC, as Malcolm just referenced, pushed for an even smaller jail um, with a bed cap of 1,438 beds. Throughout their campaign, OPPRC organizers leveraged the national media surrounding the inhuman abandonment of prisoners before, during, and after the storm, while also revealing the multi-scalar state and capital relations embedded in the per diem system and the housing of state prisoners within the jail. The per diem system by this point is $24.39 a head. Through several months of strategic discipline organizing, OPPRC won the bed cap which as a campaign was successful both in limiting the, limiting, limiting the number of folks locked up within New Orleans as well as making a small but still important dent in the overall prison population of Louisiana which has slightly shrunk in recent years. This is not to say that the fight is over. Sheriff Gussman continues to push for a larger jail. Um, the part he wants to expand right now he calls phase three. Um, that would house prisoners with mental illness, a particular sticky issue in its own right, given the city is still without anywhere near adequate mental health care since the closure of charity. Um, just the last week, Gusman filed a motion in federal court to force the city to allow him to build up this phase three of the jail. Uh, it is, of course, my hope that the courts will not find in favor of the sheriff, but that the smaller jail size will be maintained, as history shows us that a few beds here and there can quickly turn into thousands. And it's the work of organizations such as OPPRC and others, um, just a few are Vote and Flick and Breakout and others, that continue to do the critical work of creating spaces to mobilize people around locking less and less people up and to foster more expansive thinking about a world free of containment and confinement could be. It's this type of organizing work that we should be looking to as we strive to materialize a future grounded in abolition democracy and true collective freedom. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is this up? Well, um, while the, do I need to do anything to make it come up? Uh, do I need to do anything to make the projector? While that's coming up, let me just um, say uh, to Jerry, thank you so much for the introduction and for moderating the panel. And I'm really delighted to uh, be in conversation with my distinguished colleagues. And let me just say, I look up at this room, I'm, I'm a little nervous. I think I've learned everything I know from the people here. And that's quite literally in some cases. Uh, when you read my book, you're in my footnotes, you're, on, you're in my library. This is like what I've been studying coming to life. So I'm really uh, humbled to get this opportunity to uh, present my work. So without further ado, let me just jump right uh, into it. And his title uh, track for his album, Brand New Blues, New Orleans musician and longtime member of the Neville Brothers and percussionist uh, for the meters, S Cyril Neville sang, let me not try to sing for him, let me just play this, uh, the title track, Brand New Blues. <laughs> of course. Cyril Neville, uh, but the, the track and the song blends blues, funk, and soul to provide a poetic critique of the conditions in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Other songs on the album also, can you hear me okay? Is this better? Other, I'm sorry? Picture's gone, I see. Uh, having all kind of trouble here. Okay, so. Other songs on the album provide cultural criticism of the conditions. He says, you know, spending my money like it wasn't funny. Every last time, oh, what a crime. What I want to argue today is that as journalists and social scientists, many of them declared a so-called end of neoliberalism in the wake of these events, Neville provided the perspective of the brand new blues, a way of seeing that resonates with audiences who continue to experience the crippling effects of the neoliberal carceral state. These brand new blues represent the unfinished business of freedom struggles in the current moment. By drawing on the collective memory of the long black freedom struggle, Neville articulates a moral economy and social vision of an aggrieved and insurgent people that can help us grasp how the present crisis is the product of political struggles that, as Lydia just said, could have had different resolutions. The Katrina events and represented what the late blues geographer and political economist who's been evoked many times in the last two days, Clyde Woods, called a blues moment. What Clyde was arguing is that the Katrina crisis, much like the social and economic crisis of the Great Depression of the 1930s, compelled activists, artists, and intellectuals to connect directly with anti-racist social movements, to use expressive culture, to organize multiracial political alliances, 
as he put it, amongst working class black people, Asian Americans, Latinos, whites, and indigenous communities. And what Clyde says is that a focus on their intervention allows us to assess how the justice agenda of New Orleans has become a global imperative. Their visions and the visions that we've seen uh, today and will continue to see this afternoon offer a distinct alternative to the ways in which the city was represented as a war zone in state narratives and mass media uh, depictions of the event ranging from ABC News to CNN. The New Orleans Police Department was, was directed to stop its rescue mission and focus on security and law and order as Black Hawk, Black Hawk helicopters hovered over the streets. Simultaneously, Popular media representations depicted black and poor survivors of the hurricane, as has been said, as criminals and looters. And I won't say this again, but just to underscore, then Kathleen Blanco gave shoot to kill uh, orders to National Guard soldiers who were fresh from the war in Iraq in a domestic mission she described as urban warfare. George Bush appealed to the Insurrection Act of 1807 to legitimate the deployment of 72,000 troops into the region. Not as a humanitarian rescue effort, but in a mission that Gary Jones described as uh, an effort to quell, what he, and these are his words, an insurgency. New Orleans attorney Jim Lennon reported to the Washington Post that a temporary jail was set up for looting and more vaguely other crimes. And this is, as Kalamu was saying, just inside this Greyhound station that was, you know, turned into a jail. The first person that they arrested is instructive. He had gotten into a rental car, driven to the Greyhound station, and gone to the ticket counter and said, I want to buy a ticket to get out of town. And they said, I got a ticket for you, all right. And they threw him in the back of that Greyhound station that had been surrounded with barbed wire. And, you know, Burl Kane had put a sign up that said, you know, welcome to the New Angola uh, South, and brought in, uh, you know, prison guards to, to transform what should have been something to rescue people into something to uh, incarcerate them. The state's response to the crisis was unambiguous. In the words of the White House, quote, the security situation is a concern. It's a priority. And there is a zero tolerance approach, end quote. A series of moral panics around race, security, and law and order naturalized, justified, and sustained this counterinsurgent response to social and economic crisis. The black poor and the multiracial working class in the city were depicted as prone to violence, crime, and insurrection. And as Eric Tang argues, Quote, the mainstream media would offer lurid and deeply racialized accounts of looters amidst an urban crisis, a narrative that he argues in his American Quarterly piece was, grew out of the representations of the Los Angeles Rebellion of 1992. Such purportedly colorblind discourses of illegality, violence, and disorder justified the deployment of carceral reactions to crisis in the city with the highest rate of incarceration of anywhere in the country. Of course, in the country with the highest rate of incarceration anywhere in the world, with a rate of 1,480 per 100,000 residents. The Louisiana state prison population increased 285% between the early 1980s and the early 2000s. Black people were incarcerated at a rate almost six times that of whites and black women in particular were the fastest growing sector of the prison population. Louisiana's expenditures on policing and prisons constituted a growing sector of the state's budget, which in turn led to dramatic decreases in expenditure for education. So we have to see this as we're thinking about uh, change as an exchange brick by brick. Literally, what could have gone into education you know, went into incarceration. And as Malcolm laid out so eloquently, the clear majority who were incarcerated were for small time uh, violations, like parole violations. This data and the evidence uh, from one uh, report suggests that the state's 
Revanchist response to the Katrina crisis intensified the pattern of migration that the criminal justice system had been supporting for years. Large number of people, mainly poor and black, from the poorest neighborhoods in the city were displaced into the carceral system. All of these numbers bespeak a collision of race, class, and carceral state power without historical precedent, but certainly not without historical explanation. The ascendance of these neoliberal regimes of militarized policing and mass incarceration have carried with them the stamp of legitimacy. The making of the neoliberal carceral state has been accompanied by the production of a racist common sense. That is a kind of idea that this is a natural, inevitable uh, outcome that's out of nature rather than politics and economics. Common sense narratives of security located the source of social problems in the culture and behavior of the racialized poor. These purportedly colorblind discourses justified the everyday and routine surveillance of working class communities of color as natural responses to purported illegality, criminality, and chaos. As the geographer and political economist Ruth Wilson Gilmore has influentially argued, and if you haven't read that, Students of Brown, uh, I hope you will, this needs to be understood as a geographical response to a political and economic crisis. The expansion of the carceral state was also accompanied by the articulation of a historically and geographically specific definition, uh, uh, ideology of racism, which Gilmore describes as the production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Yet what I want to suggest today, and I think that the presentations that we've seen and will continue to see suggest, is that the crisis also represented an opportunity to confront this racist common sense, and it led to a public debate about inequality in the U.S. on a scale that hadn't been seen uh, since the L.A. events in 1992. It showed, as Cindy Katz so powerfully uh, explained this morning, the nefarious effects of the withdrawal of the social wage, persistent patterns of racial segregation, deepening social polarization, and as she describes, the erosion of the means of social reproduction. Neoliberals in the city appealed to moral panics as part of an effort to secure consent to coercion. Consider, for example, the work produced by the neoliberal intellectuals of the Manhattan Institute, such as the writer uh, whose, I believe, article is, is pictured here, Nicole Jelinas, in the wake of the storm. She penned a series of pieces blaming social problems in New Orleans on the purported behavior of what she described as an entrenched underclass, who, she asserted, promoted a culture of violence, drug dealing, and drug use in public space. In turn, Delinas claimed that the inability of the police to control the situation reflected what she described as a deeper cultural problem. This problem purportedly grew from what she described as political cor correctness, that she says prevented local elites from pursuing appropriate solutions to the crisis. So you ask, what does she consider appropriate solutions to the crisis? Anticipating a visit to the city by President Bush, Jelena celebrated the administration's deployment of an additional federal law enforcement and the National Guard, but argued that such military responses to this crisis were insufficient. Jelena writes, quote, it's an enduring mystery why Bush hadn't used Katrina to show the world that America can rebuild a major city using bedrock conservative principles. Law and order first. Indeed, she argued that the state hadn't been authoritarian enough before or after the storm. She says the New Orleans Police Department couldn't keep order before the storm, I mean after the storm, because it could not keep order before the storm. These intellectuals promoted carceral solutions to the crisis particularly through the depiction of poor residents as lawless, workless, criminal youth, and members of a purported underclass. And here's what's critical. They transformed an unnatural social crisis 
into a political pro program that blamed the vulnerable as the source of their own vulnerabilities to premature death. As has already been said, the entire teaching staff of the public school system in New Orleans, which is 7,500 workers, was fired, busting one of the most powerful unions uh, in the city. And I won't go I went into more detail about some of the response. I'm just going to summarize here and say that what I think is most important is for me to foreground the visions of the activists and artists who responded to this crisis and suggested that alternative outcomes were possible. In his introduction to the edited volume, What Lies Beneath, Katrina, Race, and the State of the Nation, poet, editor, and educator Kalamu Yasalam suggests the fierce urgency of linking the reflections of activists and artists with the vernacular culture at the grassroots to articulate a philosophy of praxis. And I'm quoting here. There's no substitute for face-to-face -face organizing around the needs of specific communities. It is critical that this struggle be a dynamic of praxis, a constant evaluation and realignment of thought and practice. In 2006, the poet and performer Sonny Patterson, who we heard last night, was an MC for a historic event organized by more than 100 groups to commemorate the year of struggle for the right to return and reconstruct the city. Community Labor United and the People's Hurricane Relief Fund, which Malcolm just talked a bit about, played key roles in this event. They fought for the right to return, to reclaim public housing, enforce rent control, and dramatically expand budgets for social programs such as education, hospitals, and unionized public sector jobs. They organized the march of thousands of Katrina survivors from across the country, which began where the levees broke in the Lower Ninth Ward and ended in a demonstration on the first anniversary of the storm in Congo Square, a symbolic epicenter for resistance, freedom dreams, and African-American expressive culture. To conclude, what I want to suggest is that these visions that grew out of the social movements in New Orleans through the opposing perspectives of the contentious event into razor sharp relief. They offered a critique of the conditions that have been created by structural and environmental racism, by gentrification, by neoliberal globalization, by mass incarceration, and by the militarization of the city. And they suggest that there could have been and still could be a different world in the making. One that includes the expansion of uh, funding for the public sector rather than policing prisons and permanent war. In short, they're demanding, uh, I would argue, an expanded social wage. Analyzing the freedom dreams of anti-racist social movements in New Orleans is essential for democratic struggles to confront the policing crisis that we see in U.S. cities uh, across the country, which is the deepest crisis of legitimacy for the police in at least four decades. These movements are seeking to end police violence and terror, dismantle the carceral state, and abolish broken windows and zero tolerance policing from New Orleans to Ferguson to Baltimore and beyond. The outcome of these struggles will be the product of a political and ideological struggle whose outcomes are not determined in advance. The victory will require us engaging in a struggle to fire the political imagination about the possibility of overcoming neoliberalism, and nothing less than this will do. Thank you.